um, it gives me considerable pleasure to um, introduce um, uh, Eric Grant, Dr. Eric Grant to you. Um, he um, has is a well ken face, as they say, in the Highlands, um, and he um, has worked extensively in the voluntary sector, um, particularly uh, as trustee of Dollar Museum and Grome House Museum, uh, prior to his retiral, um, so-called, uh, to Tarradale House in Russia. Um, as part of the NOSAS, um, uh, under the NOSAS umbrella, he set up the Tarradale Through Time um, uh, project, um, which is a community-based archaeological project, um, and it has had some spectacular results. Um, so we very much look forward to hearing from, um, from Eric just now. Um, if I can ask you, Eric, to um, share your screen with the rest of the, of the audience, that would be helpful. Thank you very much. So what I want to talk about this afternoon is a project, the excavation of a barrow cemetery, a monumental barrow cemetery at Tarradale. And I've put here a high status Pictish cemetery question mark, because though we're pretty certain on morphological grounds that it's Pictish, we haven't had our dates back. They've been badly held up because of the COVID situation. But where is Tarradale, you ask? Well, Tarradale is a few miles west of Inverness at the head of the Bewley Firth. If you just focus in here, there's Tarradale there. Muir of Ord is the nearest settlement, formerly called Tarradale. Dingwall there, Inverness there. <clears throat> so we start off with a lovely aerial photograph taken by the late and great Jim Bone, showing the area we're dealing with. Now this block of very fertile looking land here that's all been harvested is essentially Tarradale. There's Muir of Ord. There's the mountains towards Northwest Scotland, Ben Wivis. <clears throat> The Barrow Cemetery is in this field here, and you can see this big green island, which is at the center of the Barrow Cemetery. It's all around it. But just out of interest, the Conan stone is found there. That's just three miles away. It's the nearest symbol stone to Tarradale. There are some other symbol stones in the area. There's Balverd, which is off to the, the left, as it were, um, Strathpeffer and Dingwall, and then off to the right at Tor. But the um, certainly the Conan stone is the closest to us. So if we look at this picture again in terms of the uh, what we're seeing on there, I said a very fertile area developed on a series of raised terraces. In the Ice Age a huge glacier up here was um, disgorging um, sand and gravel into the Bewley Firth and the Bewley Firth has had several levels and these are represented by three terraces. An upper terrace here and a the Barrow Cemetery is on the middle terrace. But fertile, easily cultivated land has been in use for a very long period, prehistoric times. And a huge contrast with a greener area to the north, which is outside the, the estuarine terraces. This is just sheer boulder clay, wet, sticky, not so good farmland, pasture and timber, big contrast. So Tarradale has always been a popular area um, where, you know, people have wanted to come to and live and farm. In 2017, the North of Scotland Archaeological Society, we set up Tarradale through time, got some funding from Heritage Lottery Fund and Historic Environment Scotland. And we looked at six projects. I'll just list them in chronological order. Mesolithic Middens, some spectacular finds. Balvati is a series of rather complex Bronze Age ditches. Iron Age fort at Gilchrist, a promontory because it projects into a marsh landscape. The Barrow Cemetery, which I said were pretty sure is Pictish. A medieval Tarradale castle of which we found some evidence and a post medieval abandoned settlement. So that it is Tarradale through time. We're trying to show the picture through a very long period of time. This map created by Juliet Mitchell, who's done a huge amount of research on monumental cemeteries of Pictland. Very useful. This is Tarradale there. Other bigger um, monumental cemeteries, Garbeg, Whitebridge, um, Croft Gowan, uh, Pitgaveny, Pithulish, and so forth. Gresh up there we'll mention, Rhiney there we'll mention. It was really only when the aerial photography was taken seriously, maybe after the 18, 1970s, when we began to appreciate the scale of these features at Tarradale. So this Royal Commission photograph shows a, a variety of different things. There are some circular barrows there. This is a 
elevating ground, so there could have been quite a lot of lost lost through ploughing. We have a large complicated spread here of round and square and trapezoidal shaped barrows. And then we have these two very different scale features here, a circular ring ditch feature, and then beyond that, a square with in fact an inner square ditched feature. And the uncultivated area, we ask ourselves, why has it remained uncultivated? Is there something under there? Quick comparison with other excavated barrow cemeteries in, in the north. Um, this is Gar Beg, excavated some years ago. Similar number of barrows to Taradil between 20 and 30, though at Gar Beg there may not have been many more because this is moorland, it's not been ploughed. Well, we know that Taradil, there are losses due to ploughing. So Taradil probably had more barrows and certainly larger ones than at Gar Beg. But that is our nearest comparative. Gresham Farm on the road between Forest and Nairn um, has only been partly excavated, but there there's a very large um, square barrow, double ditched square barrow, which is about 25 meters in, in diameter. And then Rhiney, of course, um, where two square barrows, they're probably part of a much larger barrow cemetery. So back to Tannadale and Juliet Mitchell's transcription of what she saw on the aerial photographs. Now, of course, it's pretty subjective and Juliet herself has modified this diagram through time. But again, you see, it could be a ridge, a spread along a ridge here, um, though these two are at right angles to that. But also we've got another feature here. We have this ancient trackway or roadway um, we call it a track, but in fact, this was probably a major routeway in the past. It starts at the Beaulieu Firth down here and runs inland. To some extent, it's the A9 of its time. So it goes right through the middle of the Barrow Cemetery. And these bigger features also seem to be aligned on it. We open three trenches, one, two, three, to sample each of these areas. So if we start off with an aerial picture showing the excavation in progress, um, and you can see there's the three trenches again. So we start off with an overview of our trench plan. And though you can see this pattern of circular and square and trapezoidal um, barrows, some of the bigger ones are less easy to see because they're only partly excavated. So the large circular one there, we're picking up there and in the ditches there. The outer square, we can see the inner square quite clearly, but the outer square we're only picking up on the ditches there. And then we found two bits of beaker pottery, one in the ditch of this barrow, which suggests this might be a, a much older feature of this ring ditch, at least a much older feature. And another piece of pottery we found from field walking. But also in the middle here, we see something here. This is the, the, the trackway, but here we found what we thought was a, another um, iteration of the trackway, but we actually think may be part of a very large barrow, which is what this uncultivated area is covering. And within that, another smaller barrow. And this could be, again, say, I say could, could be more related to that in age rather than Pictish. Okay, let's look at trench one. This is one we just took the topsoil off and you can clearly see the barrows, nice entrance there. Barrows there and the one there. This is when we started um, taking sections across the ditches. And you can see that the ditches are not very wide, not also shallow. We know there has been erosion here, downhill as well as plough damage. So we've probably lost quite a lot on top. There were no obvious grave cuts. There is a, a section here, but that's been troweled up. We did find one or two places, possibly the base of a grave cut, but certainly no human remains. So not very helpful in the respect of saying that you know, that we have definite graves. We think we had graves there. Looking the other way towards the um, down trench one towards the uncultivated area, we did actually find a grave just tucked in behind there, but it was not in a barrel. But what I want to point out here is this sort of dip, which is the line of the old trackway. And the, the first dark smudge you see is the trackway, but rising up into that uncultivated area. So if we look at that, that's just looking into the uncultivated area. Here is the line of the trackway, this darker material. And adjacent to that, there is a remains of a stone wall, a, a sort of curb enclosing this, this area. 
And we think this is quite a late feature, part of agricultural improvements. But on the inside of that, we have another dark stain, which a bit complex in its excavation because there was a lot of later sort of charcoal deposition. Unfortunately, the unplowed area has been used as a dump for stones off the fields, for burning brushwood, agricultural plastic, unwanted agricultural implements and so forth. But we, this is what we think may be part of a large circular barrow here and within that a smaller barrow and these could well be very different ages. So moving fairly quickly to um, trench two and this is very different looking trench as I said and we've got these various features there. Um, sorry if I just go back. We have the large ring ditch feature here being picked up there then the inner square and just picking up the ditches of the outer square. That's a, a nice um, drone view. So here's the, the large circular feature, though it's not that circular, it's a bit uh, angular in places, probably built in several sections. And here's the inner square feature, and we're just picking up the ditches of the outer square feature. So looking into the, the circular feature, um, large, slightly irregular, as I said, again, no indication of a central burial or indeed any burials. There are a number of, pit-like features, but again, they came to nothing. So we may again just be getting the bottom, the very bottom of possible pits and graves, but we don't know. And we don't really know if this was a barrel. It is all we can say it's a large ring ditched feature. But the ditch is very different to what we saw in trench one. The ditch is deep and quite wide. And you can very clearly see that there. So this was a very big feature. And if we look at the section, we can see the original cut, and then original fills, which are probably mainly natural, I think, just rain wash into the pit or the ditch and all that. And then that begins to get filled up rather differently. We're getting darker inclusions, areas of soil or possibly turf, boulders and that are thrown in and then filled up with just a much more sandy um, soil. So very different feel to it. And as I said, it was in this ditch or the section next door that we actually found part of a beaker pot. And again, another beaker pot was found close by in field walking. Looking at the very top end of trench two, and I can just locate that for you. If we're just looking, we're here looking into the, the green of the Barrow Cemetery. We found this stone wall or cairn, which initially we thought might be a curbed cairn because there is boulders cairn-like material inside. So this was quite exciting to start with. And looking at it more closely here, um, this feature here is in fact the ditch of the big round ditch, barrow, whatever it may be. And this cab has been built into it. That has been cut into the, that large ditch. And you also see a lot of evidence of burning. So here is the original cut of, the, of that big round feature running through there. Here is some of the initial fill. And then you can see as clearly that's been cut into and this cab wall built into it. So it's quite a step there in the older fill. So they cut into it and built the curb wall. And then some massive burning went on in that ditch. We eventually decided that this was actually quite a recent feature, mainly because we've actually found some mortar in the wall. And we just think it was part of agricultural improvement that they walled around that unplowed area just to define it from the rest of the field. And then had an almighty bonfire or bonfires inside the ditch, perhaps just burning um, timber and brushwood as part of improvements. <clears throat> so looking again at the drone picture of the area, we were just been up here. And we've looked at the big circular feature. We can put the circular feature back on and we can put the square feature, the inner ditches, and we picking up these outer ditches here, we can put the outer square on. And what's interesting is that this outer square respects that circular feature. And I don't think this is accident that they are just in, in that disposition. Now there's absolutely nothing to see in the surface today of these two archeological features, but the, perhaps there was not that long ago. And we are fortunate in having a, an estate map of Tarradale, uh, 1788, which shows very interesting features here. It's showing a square enclosure adjacent to a trackway and also another enclosure there. Now, I think that square enclosure is, is this feature here, but to understand it, we need to turn the map the other way up. We can do that. 
So here's the square enclosure there located on top of the, you know, the archaeological findings, if you want. We can fit the circular feature in there quite nicely, because remember the ditch just nicked, or the curb just nicked that ditch, and that, in fact, is that curb we were discussing earlier. And then inside the unplowed area, where it says brush, and it says brushwood there, there's this feature. Now, the cartographer who drew up this map, David Aitken, was a very, very good surveyor and drawer. And he's very consistent in his symbolism. So this symbol of just lines, closed space lines, with an empty area in the middle, as you can see there and there, is his symbol for a mound or a hillock. And he's consistent throughout the map for that. So I'm fairly confident that this enclosure here was enclosing a mound and that inside the unplowed area, there was also a round mound. So that is, is very interesting that we can actually pick that up. As I said, nothing today, they've been, this mound in particular is absolutely no sign of it, nor that. As I said, the uncultivated area is a bit more difficult to understand because of dumped material on it. So there we have that fitting in there quite nicely. And is there another one around one there? Okay, back to trench two. We're now standing at the yellow dot looking down this very long trench, 75 meters long. And here, the first feature again is the limb of that um, large ring ditch feature. And beyond it here is the outer ditch of the square ditch feature. And if we look at a section of the square ditch, here you can see that huge ditch, many meters across. And the fill includes this spread, extensive spread of pebbles, which we were able to cut through. It's actually, unfortunately, just off the bottom of the slide there. But you can see a spread of pebbles there. And that's sitting on top of a dark spread, a bit like that, which could be turf, an original turf line, or perhaps turf had been thrown into the ditch as part of the infilling of it. So ah, maybe we'll move up now. You can see that better. Um, here is the original cut of the ditch. Here's this dark infill. And you can see that's very strict horizon, very abrupt change. And I think this has been thrown in there not that long ago, perhaps the last two or three hundred years, uh, either as turf or soil. And then these boulders thrown in and then filled up again with, um, with a, a sandy soil. We're moving right to the other opposite corner. That's the big ditch you've just seen. We're moving right to the ditch in the far corner of the outer square. And as you can see, that ditch, the character of that ditch is very different. We have here, it's much narrower and much shallower. And we wonder why that is, because elsewhere, the, the ditch where we picked out the outer ditch there, the outer ditch there and there, they are quite deep ditches like this one, but over here, it is very shallow and narrow. If we look at the internal feature, the internal square feature, we see four ditches with openings at the corners, you know, causeway corners, interrupted corners. And again, you see that on this side, which is the west side, the ditch is much narrower. And there's quite a difference. If you look at these ditches, which have got infill of stones and darker soil, but on this side, there is none of that. And we and that the skinny outer ditch is just out here. So it looks as if when this was altered, and it was comprehensively altered in my opinion, they took away a lot more of the surface than was done on this side. Within that square enclosure, there's a number of stains on the soil, which look promising, but in fact, all turned out to be natural. We find absolutely no evidence of a central burial or a grave or anything here, he, promising though that was. These all seem to be geological. We are right into you know, the geological sands and gravels of the estuarine terrace here. These lines here are probably frost wedges. There are certainly some plow marks along there and some at right angles, but this all seems to be pretty natural. This is the human activity in these side ditches. And this is a section of one of these up here, showing again quite a lot of probably fairly natural fill. And then this abrupt transition to a darker material with these boulders in it. So these boulders are really just sitting on the top of that ditch. OK, move on. Let's look at this again in a bit more detail. Here is the 1788 map showing this square enclosure with what I'm almost certain is a mound in the center. So 
has this been a barrow that has been comprehensively taken away and taken away even more on that side? Well, we can invent a barrow and draw it in. And this is what I think has happened. They took this away sometime after 1788, and they filled up these ditches. These ditches were still a feature, hence the enclosure around it. And the dark mark we saw here is that the turf off the top of the barrel. And then as they went into the barrel, and they were almost certainly taking the barrel away for sand and gravel. I mean, the soil here is very sandy, you can see. This field has been worked for sand and gravel several times. And they dumped the, the turf in here and then the boulders, they didn't want the boulders, they just wanted the sand and gravel and threw the boulders in there and then filled it up further. So it's a story. I mean, we don't know if that's correct, but it fits the evidence. And just to show there was nothing inside that square, we took a section across it, absolutely natural silts and sediments, showing some strange sort of turbations there. And I showed this to a geologist thinking he, this was going to be um, frost heaving. They said, no, it's earthquake activity. Earthquake activity? Well, the Great Glen Fault is not far away. And he thinks at one point an earthquake wave had moved through here, perhaps when these sediments were very saturated, and buckled them up like this. And then when the wave passed through, the sediments didn't come back to the original um, position. Moving now to trench three, um, very interesting trench. Well, they're all very interesting, but very different. All three trenches were quite different to each other. Trench three had a great depth of topsoil, particularly on this side here. And uh, this is Steve Birch, Steve Birch, the great Steve Birch, who was our director of the excavation. We had to call in some heavyweight excavators. We were getting nowhere here. It was so deep was the topsoil. I mean, 750, 800 millimeters deep that we then had to then employ lorries to fill up with soil and dump it a bit further off site. But having taken the soil off, then we found, as they say, wonderful things. Very clear pattern here of ring ditch in square and trapezoidal ditches, which we can see better in the drone picture when we started taking the sections out. So very large circular feature there, which we can call a barrow, but at least a ring ditch and another one there. Smaller, more normal sized circular barrow there with a central grave. And then some square features. This large square here doesn't have interrupted corners. That's the first thing. Doesn't have an obvious central grave. This small barrow with interrupted corners does have a central grave there. And this is just the corner of another small barrow. So looking at these um, sections. What, what did we find in them? This one here was excavated by our next speaker, Professor Gordon Noble, who found a number of large boulders in there that may have been chalking stones for some sort of monument in the hole. But looking at the, that's where Gordon Noble dug and here's the boulders coming out of it. Looking at two, sorry, I'd probably better if I go back one. That was that one. Here is a large circular well, pit and here, full of very charcoaly material. So we took a section of that, we look at that now. So here's that large pit with a lot of charcoal and evidence of burning in it. Here is the ring of that, or the ring ditch of that circular so-called barrow, which I think it is, but it cuts through, quite definitely goes through this pit. And we can see that in the section. Here's the cut of the pit, original pit. But here we can see quite clearly is the cut of the ditch. The ditch goes through it. And in fact, the ditch has been, we've excavated away here, but it's quite clearly cut into the, the fill of this pit. But this pit has the most amazing evidence of burning. I mean, it's a serious amount of burning and indeed several episodes. We've got burned ground, charcoal layers and so forth. So it's interesting that this was, ditch was cut through that pit because there's another very similar pit on the other side of the barrow, which is also cut through by the ring ditch. So what's that telling us? Is there some connection? What were they burning? We've no evidence of cremations. Um, were they just um, burning firewood, you know, cut down trees? Or was this a site of monumental feasting before a burial? Lots of questions there. Looking at the trench plan, um, we've talked about that one, and we talked about that one, the one that Gordon Noble excavated. What I want to now is look at some of these others. So I said the two grave cuts in here, the smaller features, we didn't look at because graves in small circular and small square barrels have been looked at elsewhere. We were more interested in the ones that were a bit more eccentric. And we looked at these two, 
this cut here was a grave, but eccentrically placed between this trapezoidal square-ish feature. And this one is actually placed between barrows. It's not actually in a barrow. So if we, these are the two there, this one, oops, and that one. So if we look at this one first, so as I said, it's between, this is the one between barrows. So here's it when we've you know, taken quite a bit out, we took lots and lots of soil samples out of here. Though we're sure it's a grave cut, no human remains, but indeed the soil is very acidic and we found really no real, well, certainly no bones. But what's very interesting in here is this dark stain here and running down here and then up, oh, can't get rid of this thing, go away, up this side here and back along there. That is almost certainly a log coffin. So we're pretty sure we have a grave cut with a log coffin, and no sign of human remains. Now it could be, as I said, it's all the bone has completely disappeared or possibly it was a cenotaph, an empty grave, something you know died and never made it back to base. Looking at the other big grave cut here, this was excavated by Steve Birch himself. And Steve's a very, very um, experienced excavator. He still found this quite difficult because the grave was cut into sand and gravel, then backfilled with the same sand and gravel. It's very difficult to distinguish the cut from the fill. And he great difficulty trying to find where is the bottom, but he kept going. They did find a bottom and he found something interesting in it. So we can clearly see the outline of body. Here are the legs. The feet are very close together, perhaps suggesting binding tied together there. But what we can also see is this, what I think is a wood or the remains of the wood of another oak coffin. So this burial was also in an oak coffin. If we look at the top half of the body more clearly, you can see quite interestingly the, the features here, the, the, the skull, the eye orbits, the mouth, you can see the arms, you see the individual vertebra. Individual vertebra, you can see the collarbone and the shoulder bones, but this is not bone. This is just a black stain on the soil. There is no bone there. So the bone is completely gone, but some chemical within the bone, phosphates or something, has been left as a deposit at the foot of the grave. And you can just see the outline of the, the old coffin, of the log coffin there. And this really is ephemeral. I mean, Steve, when he traveled through it, it just disappears within millimeters. The skull, or what looks like the skull, we tried to lift, in fact, we did lift, and this is it wrapped up and ready to go for analysis. But when we did an anal analyze it, um, there was nothing in it. There is no bone. This is just the fill. The skull had filled up with silt, gravel, but then the, the bone itself had rotted, just leaving the, the, the black deposit. We hoped we might even find some teeth, but we didn't even find teeth inside this. That was a little disappointing. So this is a nice little reconstruction done by one of our uh, members of that burial. Now, we don't know whether it was planked ends or a complete uh, log coffin. But this, as I said, was eccentrically, slightly eccentrically positioned in that large square enclosure. There may have been a central grave at some point, but certainly today, all we had within that is this eccentrically placed one. Now, clearly, we are seeing a monumental cemetery of considerable importance. Um, lots of people that here in this picture, where did they live? And this is just the final point I want to make. Well, we think probably living not very far away in this case, this huge cemetery, you know, one of the largest in Northern Scotland and with the largest monuments in, of any at present known Pictish monumental cemetery. So if we look uphill, there's Trench 3, the Barrow Cemetery, up here, we have evidence of settlement. There is a ditch that goes around the, that hill and that can be seen come on, in an aerial photograph. There is the ditch. And just inside the ditch, you can just see an interrupted feature there, which is the Palisade ditch on the inside. And this was excavated in the 1990s by Barry Jones, and who thought this was a Roman fort. He was a Roman archeologist and he, he and Ian Keeler were flying over this part of Scotland looking for likely forts. Well, unfortunately it's quite definitely not Roman, but at least he excavated it for us. So here's the uh, trench plan. Now if we concentrate in on that corner, we can see there's the, the big ditch and here it is in section. Here's a little palisade ditch running on the inside. And we have a number of quite large pits on the outside. 
we'll come back to the features in the middle in a minute. So, so that Barry Jones, still thinking he was looking for Romans, interpreted this as some sort of monumental gateway. Now, it may be a monumental gateway, I don't know, but I don't, it's certainly not a Roman one. But I'm more interested in what's inside. Now, he did get some dating material, but not very helpful for the story we're trying to tell. We have some burned ground with a Mesolithic date. We have a roundhouse date in the interior, um, late Bronze, early Iron Age. And certainly there is Bronze Age activity here. We have found parts of two bronze axes in this area during field walking. But again, on the surface, absolutely nothing to see. But what's interesting within this area here, you can see he marks a half and if he took charcoal samples from that, they were never dated. And the only evidence we have of the date of some of these internal features is these pieces of pottery here, um, some of which you've got a finish called pâté lissé fumigé, which is a sort of smoky, shiny finish, polished finish. And typological grounds, and I do mean on typological grounds only, this has been dated to 300 to 800 which would make us firmly in the Pictish period. So this is possible evidence. This is an enclosed Pictish settlement and quite a big one at that. So we could have a very large monumental cemetery with a large enclosed settlement just above. Where do we it put Caribbean? I'm just time. there. Yes. I'm just, two, two, two seconds, two seconds, uh, Colleen. Where do we put it into the overall story? Well, here are some of the important uh, Pictish sites in Scotland. Where does Taradale fit into the, the story? We don't quite know, but I think it does fit in somewhere. That's all I need to tell you. Thank our funders and, and the memory of one of our members. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eric. That was absolutely fascinating. And uh, I was sorry to uh, interrupt you no, at no. the end there. Um, Absolutely fascinating. Um, a, clearly a, a, an enormous site of, of tremendous potential, which you, you've, you're starting to realize. So um, now that can be brought to the table to, to join the discussions of um, other um, uh, Pictish uh, cemeteries and indeed potentially settlements as well. So um, I, we have just one question at the moment. So I'll just go with that. Um, and um, I will read it because it's a little complicated. It's from um, uh, Gamble, C.L. Gamble. And it says, while I know, while I know Imain Matcha is not usual or typical and wasn't necessarily a mortuary site, are there parallels with the burning of a landmark in Scotland? Compared to the process that happened in Armagh, where it was a built a large wooden concentric wooden structure filled with rocks and then burned completely, and covered over with earth. He's wondering if in fact, that's the same that you have in your archeological evidence there. He also adds, uh, apologies if I've, if I've mangled the details, trying to keep it brief. And that's why I read it because I would mang mangle it even further. Well, I'm afraid I don't really know the answer to that, but it is very interesting. I mean, that big pit, if that's what you're referring to with intense burning in it, you know, is a huge enigma. And the fact that they then it was linked with the the ring ditch. I mean, is that what the feature that you're talking about, I think? Um, yes, I think pit. so, yes, it is, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, well, it's, the, it's, the burning that, it's the burning that's the important yeah. element. Well, it, it clearly was very intensive burning. You can see that in the section. But as I said, we don't know what they were burning. Um, I, I don't know if it was rocks, but uh, it, it, that's an enigma. We've not come to a, an answer to this, but we're certainly very interested in any parallels from anywhere else. So if anyone wanted to write in and suggest what that intense burning pit was for, we'd be very, very interested. As I said, the problem is we've not had our dates back yet because they're all held up with COVID. So once we get some dates for that, the burned ground and the charcoal in that feature, then we may be in a better position to know its relationship to the ditch. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, Alison Craig has, has asked, um, are there any up-to-date scans of geophys or LIDAR of the enclosed settlement? I don't know if there's any up-to-date ones. Um, no, I think is the answer to that. I mean, the enclosed settlement, we've not paid a great deal of attention to because that was Barry Jones's excavation. And I think it's only by excavating in the Barrow Cemetery, we realized its significance and perhaps its relationship to the enclosed settlement. And in fact, last year, we were meant to be doing a, a targeted excavation within Barry Jones's excavated area, but unfortunately we weren't able to do that, but we are still hoping to do that this year and may get a bit more sense out of it. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we've got a, a question from Graham asking if there's any idea of the place of manufacture of the pottery found. Any ideas on that? No, no. I mean, I've tried to see this pottery, which apparently is buried somewhere in the depths of HES, but uh, they've never been able to produce it. But I would like to see it and maybe have another. It was looked at by the time when the, the excavation was written up and that, the, what I said that it is of that date, but where it's manufactured and where its parallels are, I don't know yet. That's something else we're hoping to do. Great, okay. Um, uh, one of the questions I would just like to ask, um, if I may just take uh, chairman's action here, is that you did show in, um, in some of the uh, ditches that they were filled in with uh, what looked like quartz, quartz pebbles, quartzite pebbles. Um, that may be not the case, but that's what they look like. And I'm just wondering if there's um, likely to be any similarity there um, with the with the other Pictish cemeteries where you do have um, pebbles which formed part of the um, of the uh, the cairns which covered over the the, the burials. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that is a possibility. I didn't mention that we did find. Well, not huge amounts of quartz, but no. we we did actually find quartz on that site when field walking, which you know alerted us. And certainly in the ditch fills there, I mean, it's not all quartz you're seeing, certainly not, but there are pieces of quartz, but there's not large quantities. I would have thought that if there was a cairn, you know, covered with quartz to make it shine out, we would have found a lot more quartz. Yes, yes, I, I, I suspect that's probably the case. Um, okay. Um, a question from Mike Holt um, saying basically that high temperatures were raised to create vitrified forts. Uh, do you see any parallel um, here with the, was it? Was it very uh, high temperature burning, do you think? Well, it looks, well, I don't know, it looks quite high temperature, but again, we've not had that tested. The, these sediments have not been properly analyzed yet, yeah. but um, I don't know how high temperature you would need to burn stone compared with anything else and whether you can detect that in the, in the burned evidence, I don't know. Okay, um, uh, a question from Roxanne uh, Reddings Wild wanting to know, is, is there any evidence or knowledge of Pictish field systems and also identification of gra grazing grounds in the area? And that's quite an interesting question given the, the landscape there. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, we know nothing with the Pictish, or I certainly know nothing with Pictish agricultural systems, except we're pretty sure they were cultivating that fertile land. That's why they were living there. And as I said, they were following many other um, societies and who had predated them in that area. And as I said, still heavily cultivated today. And this was part of the problem. And the whole project was, is there any archeology span there? We found evidence from field walking, bits of artifacts in the topsoil, but we didn't know if there was anything underneath, and that was the whole point behind it. So I'm pretty sure they were um, cultivating there, and as is rightly pointed out, the area just to the north, the area of woodland and pasture, even today, could well have been uh, a pasture and hunting area for people living on the more fertile soils. Great. Okay, thank you. Now, I've just got two questions um, which we need to take quite quickly, if that's at all possible. Um, and no more questions, please, um, from, the, from the audience. But um, So do we know when or why the backfilling was done? Well, I think it is part of agricultural clearances. Um, as I said, the 1788 map shows mounds there and certainly nothing there today. And we do know that uh, a landowner who, in fact, had the, the map drawn up undertook extensive um, improvement of the land. And in fact, there's even reference to a, a beaker being found in the Prince's Cairn. Now, we don't know where that is, but uh, clearly there was a lot of um, tidying up and uh, sorting out of the land for agricultural improvement. So I think it all dates from the late uh, 18th century. OK, um, and then just the last one here uh, from Fiona Newton, um, talking about Knock Farrell vitrified fort, where you can see the bubbles in, in, in the burnt stone. So obviously, uh, good vitrification there. So I don't know if there's any any uh, further comment required on that, but... Um... No, we, 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 we hadn't thought of vitrification there because, I mean, the ditch, we are finding no stonework in that ditch, though, as I said, yeah. it was excavated by Barry Jones, not me. Yeah. But it seemed to be, I think, of whatever was there was timber features. Um, so the, you know, the, the enclosure ditch, I don't know what happened there, but looking at the, the ditch in the ring feature, I just don't know what they were burning there. 
Okay, um, and there, there is a question from Roland Spencer Jones, and I, I, I would just um, ask if that could be taken into the breakdown session um, about the square and the round features um, and uh, as the as the um, uh, cairns um, and uh, basically looking for parallels. So um, I'm sorry, Roland, if that could be taken into the breakout session, that would um, be very helpful. Um, I'd like to just um, thank very much, Eric, for your contribution there. Um, and um, very, um, very, very interesting um, landscape. Wonderful, Dave. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Much appreciated.